Okay, Tim, here we go. Season five is rolling along. We're, at, we're near the end here, talking more advanced periodization, mainly going into strength deficit. So if anyone doesn't know out there, if they're living under a rock, what is strength deficit? So it is not essential utilization ratio, which prioritizes, huh. yeah, the stretch shortening cycle. What strength deficit is, is just in the subtitle, leveraging eccentric versus concentric contractions towards an outcome. That's it, right? Like it's the idea that we are going to do things in the weight room that are probably going to be constrained and limited by concentric strength and having some sort of diagnostic of looking at counter movement jump versus non counter movement jump, sometimes referred to as squat jump, becomes important to just see how much time we're spending with concentrically limited things. Because one of the, the theses behind, behind strength deficit is this central theme that, you know, a lot of strength coaches will come to some sort of epiphany of what is strong enough or, you know, strong enough kind of mentality. And that's off the central premise of strong enough concentric, meaning that we can, we don't count whatever it is, our ability eccentrically or even isometrically. We only really count what we can do concentrically because all gravity based lifts are going to be limited by whatever I can do concentrically or the overcoming, which is the weakest of the contraction types. But naturally we're stronger eccentrically, meaning that we have a greater ability to lengthen muscle tissue and external force at that lengthened state or a lengthening direction than we do in a shortening or overcoming. And if we're going to build our whole entire theory about training around strong enough, and that's based off of the premise of strong enough concentrically, and we have a whole blind spot, both eccentrically and isometrically, you're probably limiting overall performance. And the way we can, the difficulty with a, something like trying to understand eccentric strength versus concentric strength is the external loads are, are immense, right? So imagine trying to figure out your true eccentric strength on a back squat versus your concentric strength on a back squat. You know, that's pretty problematic if you're going to do it in a large group. It's pretty problematic if you're going to do it with an individual. Mm -hmm. And when we look at it from, well, what's the outcome from increasing concentric strength or increasing eccentric strength specifically for an athlete, it's running faster, jumping higher and throwing a med ball further, right? The traditional, you know, assessments that we utilize for athletes and athletic development. So if we look at jumping higher, well, if I use a counter movement, that's going to elicit the stretch shortening cycle. And if I'm weaker eccentrically based off of focusing too much concentrically, we actually put an artificial governor on our, our stretch shortening cycle. And the way you test that is to look at the ratio between eccentric and concentric. And if I have a closed gap, meaning that I can jump 30 inches with a counter movement and I can jump 28 with a non counter movement, that's a problem, right? 30 inches is a good jump, but that ceiling has been lowered because of your myopic focus on concentric strength. So if anything, it's a series of checks and balances to assess or appraise how concentrically focused your training program is. But then it gets into the other end of it, of like this archetype driven model. When we look at, hey, there's, there's a bunch of different sports being played simultaneously in a game of football, right? If you look at the body types, the demands, the bioenergetics, the biomotor, the biomechanic, all that stuff is dramatically different from the guys who are playing close to the line of scrimmage versus the guys who are playing far away from the line of scrimmage. And the way we classify them is they got to be good in a small confined space versus they got to be really good in a large open space. And when we look at the perimeter athletes, we look at those a lot as like a track and field athlete, like a triple jumper or a sprinter. And they have to be able to express a large distance very quickly. And then we look at a interior lineman. They're a lot more like a shot putter playing a small confined space and trying to projectile a, a metal object as far as humanly possible, or you got to be a gazelle in the, in the wild, or you got to be able to fight in a phone booth kind of mentality. And when we look at looking at your concentric strength, you know, a lot of the stuff that we see for physical development of a football team is centered off of like, what is the lowest common denominator? And I think about this quite a bit in a group dynamic. It's, it's programming to the person that's going to struggle the most with whatever it is you're programming to. That is going to be, whether it's conscious or subconscious, is going to have a big influence on you. So when you're thinking about stuff that we do outside sprint work, plyometric work, change of direction work. The offensive linemen are going to be the ones that struggle the most with that. These are 300 pound plus athletes and doing a high volume of pounding or high volume, a very, very 
detailed oriented plyometric drills like bounding or multi-directional plyos, that's going to be hard. Mm -hmm. So what we think about there is we're going to, we're going to start to maybe limit or put a artificial ceiling on the, the level of depth we're going to do or the outside stuff and, or sprint work, plyometric work, change of direction work. And then it becomes more of a focal point of the inside stuff. And we start to cater to the lowest common denominator there. And one of the things that comes out to of there are athletes that are, can cover a large distance and don't really feel physically taxed from the weight room, get anxious and bored. So we start to figure out ways to safeguard ourselves from just athletes that are really well conditioned in a confined space and struggling to rationalize that this is the best thing for them versus offensive defensive linemen are in their wheelhouse and they feel great inside of weight room. So we're figuring out a way to hold our team accountable to do the workout that we're asking them to do within the weight room. And it gets a little bit philosophy wise, but you know, one thing that became very clear and abundant was you're fighting a lot of the programming decisions and the organizational decisions when you have a uniform program. And I get yeah. it like a, in a setting with a high school or a setting like a, maybe a one to hundred coach to athlete ratio, having a unified approach is not a bad idea. Even working with freshmen or development guys in college, like it's not a bad idea to have a unified approach, like one central program, holding it accountable, making sure the standard is the standard and understanding training economy and training decisions and just very simple to still down of go up every week. We're going to do five sets of five every week. The last sets could be slightly heavier than the week before. That is the decision-making tree there. But when we start to get to more peaking, we start to get to advanced level outcomes. We have to start to make some sort of inroads to having a split program for inside and outside. And you can get into a positional stuff and look at sports physical preparation work. You can get into a bioenergetic, like I heard this, our wide receivers and DBs are running about 10 times the amount of our offensive defensive alignment. So mm -hmm. we need to prepare them from a physiological perspective. We get into a biomechanical, right? We look at in terms of strength deficit specifically is this idea of, all right, well, our inside the box guys need to create a lot of inertia because they're coming from a static position. We're rarely that our wide receivers and DBs, I know they come from a line of scrimmage, but they predominantly are changing direction with momentum. And managing that momentum becomes more and more important than be able to come from a static position. And we get into this split approach of, can you change direction with zero velocity? You can change direction with minimal drop-off in velocity. And the qualities that we need to develop before that, from a strength training perspective, from a outside movement perspective, needs to have some sort of synergy with the overall demands that that athlete can be placed under. And when we start to look at the the organization of how I structured my strength training program, which is probably center off. Can I get the whole entire team to comply with what I'm asking to do versus the other end of I got elite level athlete trying to have their best senior year or preparing for the NFL and preparing them to do what they're asked to do on the field from a, all right, this person needs to be good in space and I need to do more stuff outside. I need to do shorter ground contact things. I need to do more top end speed or max velocity. I need to get them progressing to things that are more congruent with what they're asked to do on the field versus our interior linemen. We can go double down harder on concentric strength because that behooves them. And we can utilize things like accommodating resistance and strongman and plyometrics with a with no with no stretch shortening cycle from a static position or ballistic exercise, we should call them. Maybe we get more focus on Olympic lifts with our interior linemen because that is a great rate of force development, high power output strategy to develop that. And then they have the, 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 the funny thing. It's so like the, what I, I, there's a little tangent here, but I find it such a funny thing when you hear like other strength coaches talk about Olympic lifts are not beneficial. Like if you can't teach a division one football player how to do an ankle clean or a snatch, like quit, like you suck. Like, God dang, man. Like I'm not, I wouldn't call myself a good athlete, but I always tell them, I just got to demo one good rep, man. And they can take one good one. Yeah, just do one good one, like A-skip. You'll see my right leg demonstrate a really good A-skip. Like, they got it from there, trust me. Like, they're, they'll be better at you very shortly, and that's okay. Um, but with that being said is, you know, Olympic lifts would be a great strategy. Or if I'm going to do Olympic lifts, like, in a uniform level to my whole entire team, going from a static position, like blocks or the gr a floor from, from my interior lineman versus maybe utilizing a eccentric load or, like, doing a hang clean with a eccentric preceding movement before I go into that propulsion, or maybe I do some more rhythmic work where I work on, you know, timing that, 
that RDL creates oscillation in the bar and then go into a snatch or a clean. Like there's the, the, the decisions you can make once you realize that I need to either enhance the gap or shrink the gap become so uh, just amazing. Uh, and it, what I think about this like transition of like, I got to get this team doing the right thing all the time. And if I'm good at what you're doing and you believe in what you're doing and you have conviction and you have a, a presence about you, that team will buy into whatever it is you're asking them to do. And then it evolves into the, all right, man, we just got to keep chopping wood and carrying water. And we got to keep doing this, man. It's all about discipline. It's all about culture. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then you look at it from the, the other end of it of like, can I do more? And do I toggle out a drill that I would normally do every day? So instead of doing icky shuffle, we're going to do two in each ladder on the, on the agility ladder. Like that is an innovation, but on the other end of the spectrum, it's like, can I really push here? Can I really push the boundaries? And then you task your staff. And if you have a bunch of resistant people on your staff that don't like change, fire them and get people who do like, I'm Brittany's you know, staff. Yeah, as you, if you, as a leader, you should be the one who's most resistant to change because you're the one who has to deal with the consequence of it not working out. And you're the one who has to formulate a plan to execute this and making sure everyone's in the right thing. And that's a lot more work from a cognitive perspective on the leader. But when you have a good staff that's capable and willing and really, really smart and gives good solutions and realizes no plan laid out ahead of time is, is going to be perfect, but we're going to be able to refine and improve it rapidly to make it perfect. Then mm -hmm. you know you can do something like this. And that's essentially the, the broad strokes of something like strength deficit. So we're back at Army West Point. Mm -hmm. We finally are able to get through the warm up where yeah. we're more disciplined. We're hitting all our reps, sets, tempo, all that. How did you decide who was ready for that more strength deficit specific approach? Yeah. So while well, we were to the point of like we finally got through the warm up, for the people out there who are listening, one of the the interview questions Coach Munkin asked me when he was interviewing me for the position there, which it was a stack deck. I was definitely the lowest guy in the totem pole, but I think his answer really sealed the deal. It was like, what would you do day one? I was like, what do you want them to look like three years from now? He's like, what does that have to do with anything? I'm like anything that we're going to do day one is going to be relative to what you want them to look like three years from now. And he's like, I want them tough, physical, and trained. I was like, okay, we're going to have to define that. He's like tough, you know, like being really, really tough on the fourth down, being tough in the fourth quarter, being disciplined, not having false starts, not making mental errors, and then being, being trained. Like they look like they, they were coached and they look like they were prepared by Army football staff. Like, okay, that's what we're going to do day one. And he had a meeting with the team. And up until that point, it was like more observation. I wasn't, my contract wasn't signed, so I couldn't really participate. And it was pretty loose, to be honest. It was. It was like the respite for the team to come up there and just kind of let their hair down a little bit. Like they they got throttled sun up to sun down, down the hill by the, in the barracks and class and, and military training. And then they got to the complex and it's like, now I could be a normal college kid, which is understandable. Don't disagree with that. I mean, there still has to be some sort of standard. And mm -hmm. in some level, it became apparent that, you know, they, Everyone was just expecting to lose based off of not really putting a lot into it. And Munkin had a meeting and he said, you got three minutes to get to the indoor. And for context, you know, it's probably about a 30 second jog, but most of the guys did not bring their cleats because they knew we were going to be running. We gave very clear instructions that we're going to go running. So bring your cleats with you. And the guys didn't. So they ran down the locker room, had to get their cleats, made it over there. Majority of the team got there within five minutes, but we, we went through a pretty harsh punishment of that. And the message was you quit before you even started. And if you don't believe that you can do something, why even start? Like just walk out now. And mm -hmm. then like, that's the start. And then we went into the warm up, which was here's a line, finish the drill, pass the line. If you don't finish the drill, pass the line, we'll go all the way back and we'll do it again. So our first day was just basically doing a dynamic warm up. We didn't even get to the weight room. And I was like, we missed today. Like today's a bad, today's a bad day because you guys could not take simple instructions and execute in order for us to get to the weight room. The stuff that's going to make a big difference. We're going to have to be able to execute basic level instruction. And there was no one who mints words. There's no one who misleading. There was nothing that was maybe a, oh, gotcha. It was very clear and very deliberate. You just made the choice not to do it. And that's a problem. You got to make a choice to do it. And when we think about that day, relatively speaking to three years from then, and we're like, hey, we're going to really split this program up and we're going to have multiple levels. So at, that, at the peak of my time in Army, we had inside, outside the box. 
We had an elite and advanced, and we had a development group. We called them Bravo, which transitioning from your freshman to your sophomore year in Bravo, and then we have advanced, and then we have elite. And advanced and elite were broken up into inside and outside the box. Bravo was just a straight uniform program because truth is, is very simple things done effectively is the best thing we could do for those kids. Mm -hmm. And then as we started to get a little bit more nuance, like it's the difference between advanced and elite was well, just a harder lean into concentric or eccentric. And let's say that there's, you know, peak things that we can look at from an eccentric, like weight release hooks. We can look at bounding, which has massive eccentric forces versus inside or concentric outside the box guy or concentric inside the box guys doing power cleans, doing inertial work, doing combinating resistance, more advanced strongman stuff has a massive concentric peak. And when we think about the organization of that, we just create that as a hierarchy. We're going to do more traditional front squat, back squat with, with alpha or advanced inside the box, which could have a concentric kind of focus for outside the box guys, where we just do a little bit more time and attention eccentrically. And we're probably focusing on relative strength, which is more of time allocated towards eccentric strength. And then we just start to progress to elite. But that transition from advanced alpha to elite, that became a question of, not only could they tolerate this training stress, but do they have the maturity? The, mm -hmm. the thing that was so evident with our advanced alpha kids was this denotation of they work their ass off in the weight room, but they just don't take care of themselves when they're not here. And you see it, right? You see it come out in day three, day four of a training program. You see it come out in weeks two, three, and four of a mezzo. Like they just start to decline or don't progress as quickly as they should be because they have poor lifestyle, poor time management just poor overall discipline. And you might think that seems contrary to what you would expect from an Army West Point kid, but most of those kids are just surviving. Like that's the truth is they're just trying to keep their head above water. They're, they're young, they're, they're gonna procrastinate, they're gonna put things off, they're gonna prioritize short-term gratification instead of long-term uh, relief, right? Because in their mind, it's just only gonna lead to more work. The quicker I'm done, the more things I gotta do, I gotta pick up the slack for someone else. and it, it's all fair, but the truth is if I'm going to put is probably a challenging of a strength training program and strength and conditioning program on a college athlete in all of college sports, that they have to have an assemblance of lifestyle, personal choices, discipline, you know, making sure that every day that they're training, that they're not coming in there and the slightest bit less prepared than they should be. And there's a select few that can do that. And, you know, a couple of things that we looked at in terms of their, their punctuality? Are they on work out the time? Do they have any, what we call callbacks or do they have missed reps and coaches have to address it with them? Do they skip out on sets? Are they just very difficult to learn technique? Do they, are they resistant to change? Probably not going to handle high variation, high intensity based program. And then, yeah, there is some sort of genetic potential from that too, where there just are people that are just going to be high responders and can adapt to it. And we wanted to, yeah, like give those kids a little bit of a shot, but if it was a maturity thing, if it was a discipline thing, you're probably not going to get the opportunity to go to this very, very advanced level programming because you got to look at it from the context of what really our elite level program was. It was pushing the upper limits of volume and intensity. And I've talked about this before, but I don't hedge my bets. I don't try to go into a program thinking about what's the least I can do, but it's about figuring out what I need to do and do the most possible. And we did it right. I mean, there's there's great case studies in those groups of about 10 kids in that last year, inside and outside, that were probably pushing the brink multiple times. Mm -hmm. And they had to make a decision, right? That giving up short term, like, hey, man, I really want to go out this weekend, or I just really like to get some gluttonous food, or I don't know, man, like, what's the difference? No one's watching. No one cares if I do this last set or not. And it's, that was the difference. It's the willingness to sacrifice and make the, make this push through that struggle to get to the outcome that they know they want. Cause one of the resigning messages we talked about was like, Hey, our leaders need to lead and your ability to get out there in front of our team and express where you think the problems are and where you think we can really address this. And it was just the comfortability with it. And one of the more powerful messages was from our, one of our seniors, Steve Johnson, who we're reading legacy, read the chapter of plant seed, you'll never see grow. And he talked about the legacy of army football crying after the last game, meaning that we lost and the seniors or firsties, what they call them there would cry. And 
the legacy for Army football first D was crying after your last game. And he's like, I would like to end that. And I would like everyone in this room to do more. And I would like everyone in this room to, to try harder. And I would like everyone in this room to make bigger sacrifices because I'm tired of seeing the firsties leave here. Guys I love, guys I'm going to be working with and going to war with cry after the last game. And that's their legacy and that's their memory from Army football. I wouldn't want that to be mine. And I think everyone at that moment got the message. And the, the people that like affirmation development, I'm like, I'm saying this to the world and people got to, people know that I want this. And then that trickle down effect. And it played out throughout the entire year. Like the, the tip of the spear component of our first D, like Andrew King, who's coming in day after playing 70 snaps and having four tackles for loss and 12 tackles front squatting 200 kingle, kilos for a single. And coach Brian has freaking out. He's like, this isn't safe. I'm like, he made the choice. I didn't let him go. Let him go. I, I would stop if it, I thought he was bad. Like, trust me, he can do it. And then the waterfall effect down or. At one point, I remember, I remember our defensive coordinator was kind of like, you know, sizing me up. He's like, what's your take on how many 300 pound cleaners we got? I'm like, it's good. It's not bad. I'm like, sign of general strength. Like, it's good. And he's like, you know, well, how many guys do you think would have a 300 pound clean? I was like, I don't know. A lot. And he's like, well, walk me through like how many people you do. I'm like, well, just come down to the weight room. We probably have everyone in the weight room at least cleaning 135 kilos during training. And he's like, what do you mean? I'm like, every single one of our guys can probably clean 135 kilos. So I'd say hundred, I don't know. And it was this like moment of like looking down the line of like, you see Andrew King or you or some of our other really, really strong guys just put in 20 kilos, 20 kilos, 20 kilos. Like it was like, just that was the case of like, I'm going to put 20 kilos until I get to about 130, 140 kilos. And then I'll start doing my micro loading then and just seeing the waterfall effect, effect down. And one benefit to the elite program was that it was creating this, like, this is what happens when you put all everything you got into something and you see guys like going through inertial work with 240 kilos and change. You see, like, you see our wide receivers and DBs hang snatch at hundred kilos. You see these incredible things outside of guys doing 20 yards in a penta jump. You see these speed cuts, like it's pretty clean. You know, you see these, these 10 yard times of like, yeah, our, our inside the box guys at 265 pounds are putting up like a, a one, four, nine, like these guys are cruising. Like you see it. And like, that's, that has an impact positively because they see the value of hard work and dedication and what could actually pay off them. And having that validation from the effort they're putting in was monumental. So it's basically mainly you went off like training age and maturity. Did you have any situations where you, you bump someone up and it's like, ah, oh, you're not ready. How, how did you approach yeah. those conversations? No, I should have been well ahead of it. And we have an interview yeah. with them before we move into it. And I'll tell them why they, I don't think they should be into an elite program. And sometimes they're like, I, I disagree. I want to challenge that notion. Okay, well, if you do go into it and I'm, I'm holding you to a standard, are you comfortable with me actually pushing you to that point? And, you know, that's like, take some time, think about it. Like, and it's a challenge to your manhood, so to speak. But yeah. no, it didn't happen there. And I would say that would be a unique thing to Army West Point of yeah. like, you know, just... At that point, you know what you got, right? Like they've, they've been through as about as tough and rough of a situation as you could possibly imagine between beast barracks and, and staff training, which is military training in the summer for them. You know, like the, the transition from a eight week staff to a three week staff meant like quad, what double digit stuff in the field, which is like pretty much two thirds of your time. Fields for yeah, like weeks. Which is like the picture, like doing maximal sprinting for your sprint workouts, like only every day. Yeah, you're just doing full on sprints every single day. And that's all you're doing in double digit count. Like it's just a crazy amount of intensity for a huge bike. But at that point, like if a guy didn't have the grit as Angela Duxworth would describe, you would know, you would absolutely know. And I, I don't know if it's a universal thing for every college, right? Especially like, as you look at kids can pack up and go when they, when it doesn't align with the things that they want, or I think most athletes deep down want to be pushed and want to be challenged, but it has to have some sort of, um, instant gratification and synergy with their versus army. I don't know if they're as like worried about that. Right. Cause it's like, well, as soon as I graduate here, I still got five more years in military service. Like just, it changes perspective on things. Like I'm, I'm okay training really hard right now. This is the best I'm aware this would be the best time of my time in the army and I'm yeah. okay. With that. So thank you for that versus. A normal division one kid might not be as 
align with that, but no, I never really came down to it. And I think that's just, do you have a good inventory of your staff and a good inventory of your, your guys? You know, that, that makes a huge difference in terms of you trying to have a program that's really advanced is, do you have a good inventory of who you're working with or not? And if you don't, you need to go back to that. Yeah. Well, that goes back to earlier in this season, you know, taking the time for those one-on-ones and getting those answers. No doubt. I got a little visitor here. Come here. I see. Um, see. (laughs) All right. Take home. Strength deficit. We have to look at this as a model. And one of the things I think is so important about a model is all of them are wrong, but some are useful. And one of the things I was very, very assertive with is this is a archetype driven model, meaning that I have inside, outside the box, if it's really nicely into that, if I have track and field or a cyclical sport that has different distances or different demands, then yes, I need to be very cognizant of that is a good model for that versus basketball, soccer, which are all sports that have been very, very cool about trying to adapt it. And maybe it's just picking one of the ends of the spectrum of like, Hey, this is what I'm gonna do for a a midfielder and a defensive person. Uh, great. Awesome. You know, and I, I think that's kind of the thing of like going back to what I talked about at the beginning of most strength and conditioning programs are going to have some sort of concentric limitation. And mm-hmm. we typically shrink the, shrink the deficit organically just from doing normal compound closed kinetic chain exercises that are concentrically governed. And if we have an, at least an assemblance to go, okay, can I trickle in more eccentric loaded time and attention? more eccentric oriented things that are going to create a little bit better adaptation eccentrically. Uh, Maybe I need to organize my plyometrics based off of of body size, relative strength or position. Maybe I need to look at the stuff that I'm doing in the field in terms of speed cutting or power cutting or top, top end speed or max velocity compared to speaking to acceleration work or short sprints. All that stuff has a tremendous impact on the overall program. And it's less about the individual model of archetype driven based programming versus this other end of the spectrum of just having a series of checks and balances to organize your training more effectively. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, this was great, Tim. I appreciate you taking the time. You got a whole course on the subject. So I, I feel like we don't need to get any deeper. If you mm-hmm. are, if you're peaked, I definitely recommend getting in there, getting in that course. Cause it goes super deep on how to, how to best maximize, uh, those choices and leveraging, uh, eccentric and concentric. There's no doubt we're getting a body weight right now. What does it say? We don't know. Oh, yeah. Thank you. That's right. Yeah, I'll see it. <laughs>